Welcome to Aviston Critic. I'm Don Gray. Uh, as you're probably aware, there was recently an exhibition of Seurat's, George Seurat's drawings uh, at the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, Georges Seurat, of course, was the French post-impressionist, uh, one of the four great uh, revolutionary and influential painters of the late 19th century, <coughs> working at the same time as Van Gogh, Cézanne, and Gauguin. And uh, Seurat, of course, is responsible for the development of a painting style called uh, pointillism, uh, where he used very small dots of paint to build the form, and uh, also known as neo-impressionism, uh, another approach to pression, uh, impressionism, a new approach to impressionism. And the, the new approach was the formalization of the loose, spontaneous, impressionist brushwork, uh, leading to uh, a certain uh, static quality in his paintings. Uh, we'll take a uh, look at his uh, first picture here. What we'll be taking a look at is, of course, Le Grand Jatte. We mentioned it briefly last time on our last program, <clears throat> and we talked about the stylized handling of the figures, the fact that the painting really represents kind of a, a transition point between the naturalism of the Impressionists, the realism of the Impressionists, the soft, easy poses, and an increasing stylization. Perhaps one could interpret it as the beginning of the mechanization of the human figure under the effect of 20th century technology. Now, everyone talks about uh, Seurat, everyone talks about La Grande Jatte in terms of the uh, mathematical quality of the painting. Everybody talks about the uh, sense of order and the rigidity of composition and so forth. And let's, let's go back to La Grande Jatte just for a moment. Uh, but what really struck me at the exhibition of drawings at the Metropolitan was an unsuspected depth of, of poetry in Seurat, uh, an unsuspected depth of, of mood, of, of melancholy, in a sense, and perhaps more in the drawings than the painting. But I think when we begin to look at the picture a little more closely, we begin to see that uh, there is a, a beauty of mood, there is a beauty of poetry. Uh, uh, without that sense, uh, perhaps, of melancholy. That is in some of the pa uh, paintings, however. If we go to the next one, uh, we see a study of a figure for the Grand Jatte, the uh, figure of the man fishing, which, which is in the upper left-hand corner of the uh, painting itself. Now, we're all familiar with the, the simple silhouette effect of, of his pictures. Uh, but I wonder how many of us really respond in this, for example, it's enhanced in the study of an individual man, a certain sense of loneliness of this early industrial man beginning to uh, move into himself, to move inward for, into his own inner life, uh, pulling away perhaps from the incipient, the onrushing uh, depersonalization and mechanization of the 20, fast approaching 20th century. And here the single solitary poetic figure uh, casts his little hook into the, into the waters. And uh, we have the sense of, of personal involvement and a certain sadness, a certain melancholy of mood. Now we'll see some of the same thing in a drawing uh, of a woman fishing. And she is a study for the uh, a woman in the far left of the painting of Le Grand Jatte. He did numerous paintings and drawing studies for it. Seurat was extremely meticulous. He was an extremely hard worker, but working for hours and hours and hours and hours, putting these little dots of paint on the canvas. Here he's working with Conti Cran, and people talk about these drawings as the, if he draws with the side of the Conti Cran, I'm sure he did, or black chalk, it gives a speckled effect to the drawing, uh, where the paper, the rises of the paper pick up the uh, chalk. And people equate this with the, a neo-impressionist, pointless style of his paintings. Now, it, it's probably, um, whether it's true or it's simply an accident of technique, I think we have to go beyond that to talk about the poetry, a certain quiet sense of melancholy in some of these figures. You know, he's simplifying, he's stylizing. Uh, we mentioned a certain comparability to that of uh, Piero della Francesca in the uh, Renaissance. Uh, he's getting a certain essential qual human quality in these pictures. In the next, uh, next painting, 
uh, we'll see the landscape setting for Le Grand Jatte unadorned by figures. And uh, obviously, the, I think the poetry of the landscape is, is fairly apparent. You know, without, without the figures, it, it perhaps echoes like uh, a em vast empty hall when we think of it having been peopled with all those figures as, as uh, stiff and, and sharply delineated as they might be. Uh, there is still is this sense of, of echoing emptiness in it. But there's a certain poetic quality, a gentleness in the uh, landscape. And uh, uh, whether you would call it sadness, uh, perhaps not, and, and certainly not melancholy. There's a certain sunlit, light feeling to it, but there's a poetic gentleness that perhaps will, in other pictures, turn to uh, melancholy. Let, let's take a look at the, uh, the next one, please. Next painting is a uh, man leaning on a parapet, uh, painted in the early 1880s, 1880, 1881. Le Grand completed about 1886 after two or three years of work. Uh, in these early pictures, as in his study of the man fishing, we can see the technique is, is uh, uh, looser, it's, it's freer, he hasn't yet reached that point of, of dots. Uh, but look at the sense of, of loneliness, the sense of isolation of the single broadly painted figure leaning against the wall uh, in the early dawn light or the light of the moon. And uh, this begins to have a sense of, of heavy melancholy, of, uh, of certainly poetry in it, but there is a great sense of sadness in Seurat. Okay, we can go to the next picture. And uh, it was really apparent in the drawings at the Metropolitan. Perhaps there were, oh, I don't know, 30 drawings and, and two or three small studies, uh, small paintings and one small study of uh, Le Grand Jatte uh, in the exhibition at the Met. And uh, with all the, the blackness in the drawing, the darkness in the drawings because of the chalk, it just enhanced this tremendous moodiness in this man. And uh, I, I personally had the feeling of this a sense of, of um, looking at the world, but at the same time somewhat withdrawing from it. And in the drawing we, we just saw, maybe we can go back to it just very briefly before we go, go to the next one. There, there is in the drawing of the figures, the, the darkness of the drawing, the angularity of the figures, uh, couldn't this be some peasants from Van Gogh's early potato eaters period? It has that same uh, sense of, of loneliness and isolation in the, in the figures themselves, just the feeling uh, emanating from the drawing and the angularity of it, perhaps not as striking as uh, um, Van Gogh, but very, very uh, closely related, I think. Okay, we can uh, proceed on to bigger and better things, and we'll have a little bit of fancy manipulation here. <laughs> behind the scenes business. And I'll steal a look and see what we're coming. Okay, here we uh, come to another painting uh, by Seurat. Uh, some houses in an avenue of trees. And we'll compare it in just a moment uh, to uh, a drawing. Uh, it's obvious why people talk about the uh, geometrization of Seurat, the stylization of Seurat, the classical order of Seurat, the mathematical uh, qualities in Seurat's work, and Seurat tried to work by formula. You know, that, that certain directional lines express certain emotions, uh, you know, the upward vertical lines is expressing certain masculine aspiration, horizontal lines, a certain uh, passive uh, repose and feminine qualities, and one can easily uh, interpret reasons <clears throat> why those lines would have those qualities. But there are many artists who work by theory and who work by uh, preconceived ideals and ideas, and their work is stifled and it shows it. But Seurat transcends the uh, classicism of his work. He transcends the mathematicals, this almost fanatic quest for order through the poeticizing element, the emotional quality in his paintings. And I think when we look at this picture, we look at the deep shadows at the lower right, we look at the dark tree silhouetted against the light, and we, we look through almost a, a square keyhole to the red roof building at the right. There's, there's a certain uh, poetic uh, 
uh, visionary quality that he gets in these pictures. Ge geometric, yes, but very, very poetic. Okay, we'll go to the next one. It isn't realized as widely as perhaps it, it should be that Paul Cezanne in his painting is very, very much the same. There is this desire for order, this desire for classical solidity and an, an, e an eternal quality that perhaps compensates in a psychological sense for the artist's own uh, uncertainty. Certainly, we talked about Suzanne last program briefly. There was an underwriting unease in the man, a sexual unease, a, a, uh, an inability perhaps to express himself sexually in a complete sense. Now, I don't know anything about Seurat's uh, sex life. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, he, he had a mistress and so on, and, and I'm sure functioned fairly normally. He was close to his mother. He was reclusive, somewhat uh, secretive individual. And uh, it's natural for him to go into a studio and work long hours on his paintings as he come, tries to come into contact, uh, get his life under control, in a sense, through his art work. And this, of course, is, is a uh, well-known artistic function or a device or a, a way that artists realize themselves. Uh, you know, in looking at the drawing, which was up there while I was chattering on about other things, it, the blackness of the crayon gives that work this haunted, mysterious quality. That is a haunted house in the left rear there. An indescribable uh, triangular form at the right that might be a tree, it, it might be um, some uh, angle of a house, a roof house, or some irregular haystack, whatever it is, this whole picture is eerie, it's, it's moonlit, uh, houses at evening or dawn, and it suggests very much some of the qualities of Albert Pinkham Ryder or Edvard Munch. There's a drawing that was at the uh, Met, and I wish uh, I had gotten a photograph of it. I couldn't get it. That was as frightening as anything that Munch ever created. A woman standing with an overcoat that spread wide, almost like bat's wings, holding a dog on a leash, at, and, and there was a look on her face that would make that would fit very easily on the scream or any other tormented picture by Monk. Okay, well we'll go to the next one. And it's a simple enough uh, painting. This was not at the Whitney, entitled The uh, Watering Can, uh, painted before Le Grand Jatte, and we can see a certain uh, realism, if we want to, a certain roughly impressionistic handling of the brushwork that precedes his uh, very mathematical, pointless style. And uh, what poetry there is in that picture. Something about the picture, whether it's the placement of the water can, the carefully mathematical looping of the handle in that circular sense, kind of repeating the curve of the path as it goes back, uh, a very distinct geometric shape, and then we reach that wall at the top part of the picture, which has vines uh, growing on it, and the horizontal top of it is a brick orange red, and then beyond it, dark foliage. And I, I maintain that there's something extremely uh, mysterious. Mosquito flying around here. We, I guess we'll leave him alone. His life's going to be very short anyway with the onset of winter. But there's something very mysterious, very poetic about the meeting of that wall and those distant uh, trees behind it. It's something that expresses uh, the mystery of life, we go beyond the known to the unknown. We leap beyond that wall and we don't know what's there. It's like Van Gogh's pool hall where you go through the door at the end into some kind of hell. You know, you've been in hell already in the pool hall and then you go into another kind. Here it's not hell, but it's a, uh, it's almost going from life on to the beyond in a sense, the way Suzanne did in the great bathers. The bathers in the foreground in life as it is now, going beyond across the river to those two distant figures that we saw. Uh, last time, suggesting the transmigration of the human spirit from life uh, through whatever processes it may take to death. So there's, there's more to that picture, there's more than geometry uh, that meets the eye. We go to the next one, and uh, we see a drawing that was uh, at the Metropolitan in the George Seurat show, uh, recently over, and we see a portrait of the artist's mother. Uh, in many of Seurat's pictures, his drawings, figures lose their individuality. And uh, as one would suspect in, in a portrait of one's mother, there perhaps is more a feeling of personality than in the woman uh, fishing on the side of the bank. The woman fishing becomes more or less a universal generic figure. Uh, but I would suggest that Seurat's mother 
is not all that personalized. We'll come to a drawing in a minute that is more personalized even than uh, Seurat's mother, his portrait of his friend, the artist uh, Armand Jean, or, yeah, Francois Armand Jean. Uh, but there's a generality about the figure. It's solid. It has that speckled quality done with the side of the chalk. And it, uh, I kind of have the feeling that the loss of personality in these works is, is Seurat's way of telling us that he's responding to some of the pressure of the gradually on, gradually on rushing, it's on rushing, uh, sense of alienation and dehumanization in the 20th century. And uh, I think this geometrization and simplification that we see in painters like Seurat and Cezanne uh, is expressing that, is also expressing their desire for a structural order that will help them to cope psychologically with all of this immense change that they feel taking place. Artists are supposed to be sensitive. They're supposed to be the antenna of society. They're supposed to be uh, out there on the forefronts uh, solving emotional and psychological problems, solving pictorial problems, expressing these uh, their solutions and their fears pictorially. And the greatest ones, of course, do it the most effectively. If we go to the next uh, picture, uh, this is a study for uh, his picture of the models, which was painted following Le Grand Jatte, uh, about 1888, 1889, but dates, again, don't really matter. Uh, and we see in more detail, particularly in the small study where the dots become larger, the effect of the pointillist style, which does two things, and I think two contradictory things. It, it tends to order the surface of the picture. It begin, you know, it's another aspect of this geometrization, this sense of trying to order the surface of the picture to control it because the world is rapidly becoming uncontrollable. But at the same time, it tends to dissolve the figure. You know, it tends to let the figure slip away into this poetic uh, vapor, this depersonalized nothingness. There's a sense of a person there, but not the sense of a specific person there. And this is some of the contradiction of a 19th century and 20th century painting in the post-impressionist. We, we see them uh, hoping to, doing all they can to hold on to reality, to create a, uh, an art of stability that uh, is somewhat contradictory to the sense of change and evolution or devolution that's taking place in society and personal relationships and man's relation uh, to himself in society. And we see them clutching desperately at structure, but at the same time, it's slipping away from them uh, in a very paradoxical moment. Uh, in the next picture, we come to that one we were talking about uh, earlier, the more sharply defined, the picture that has a sense of personality uh, Seurat's painter friend, Francois Amangin. And it's more carefully drawn than the others. It's more sharply delineated. He's still using the side of his chalk or his conic crayon to get, and it gets that flickering effect that, that ties it in stylistically with his uh, paintings, his pointless style paintings. But there is ever present in the drawings, as in the paintings, which I've come to realize this, this sense of poetry, this sense of uh, a, a darker underworld, a darker undercurrent. Uh, the blackness has a great deal to do with it. Let's face it, uh, when we think of what black symbolizes, it uh, symbolizes the night with all its terrors, of course. That's when we have our nightmares at night. And uh, it symbolizes uh, <clears throat> uh, a death, of course. Uh, very obviously, we, we dress in black for, for mourning. Uh, it's the absence of light, and light, of course, can mean spiritual or intellectual uh, greatness or holiness or insight. You know, the light dawned, and I, I saw the light. I, I saw the way to solve my problem. I saw the meaning of life in its, its most profound interpretation. Uh, but when we get down to blackness, we think of, of the robes of nuns, the clerics garb, black, the denial of life, in a sense, meaning the denial of the flesh, uh, attempting to unite with more eternal principles than the transitory elements of the flesh. So black is, is pregnant with symbolic meaning. Okay, we, we, go, we go back in time, before the Grand Jatte. 
and before his pointless style has been developed. And we come to uh, the bathers, bathers on the bank of the Seine, uh, I presume, uh, painted about uh, <clears throat> 1880, between 1882 and 1884. I, I don't have exact dates, but I, I don't believe dates are the important thing. I think it's the artwork that's important. Um, and of course, we see the simplification of the figure, the broad handling of the figure, but also the poetry of the figure, the, the magic of the scene. Uh, it's beautifully rendered and, and believable, I, I'm sure, in a realistic sense. Uh, he eliminates tedious, insignificant detail to have the broad impact of the picture uh, make its, its formal statement, its statement of form, its statement of composition, but he also captures a feeling of an everyday outing on, uh, <clears throat> in Paris, presumably. Uh, but it transcends the everyday, it, it becomes an eternal statement because of this simple, solid rendition of the figures, that is uh, Seurat's hallmark. And Roger Fry, in writing about the English critic some years ago, 30 or 40 years ago, writing about George Seurat, spoke about the significance of the overall design and how Seurat is so totally aware of everything. Let my little pinky intrude on the picture and, and look at that little tab on the back of the boot in front of the boy and how that tab becomes a significant directional element, a significant uh, pointing back into the other dark elements of the uh, design of the jumble of clothes there, how that little touch becomes so significant in the overall design when you, when you become aware of it. You know, so he's eliminating meaningless detail, making significant formal statement here. But it, it's reality transmuted into eternal values and qualities. Okay, we'll, we'll go to the next one. And th this is a painting that is part of the Met uh, collection, the per La Parade, or Parade, the sideshow. Uh, it was not in the Seurat exhibition, and I, I'm not sure why it wasn't, but uh, since it was mostly devoted to drawings, perhaps that's the explanation. But there is a mystery. There is a luminescent poetry in this picture, painted in a beautiful series of blues, violets, uh, purple, reds, and oranges, and uh, uh, yellow greens, mysterious shining of not only our photographic lights on the picture, but the uh, candles at the uh, top uh, making this beautiful uh, ordered design to it. This is a classic textbook painting and in, in expressing to someone the elements of design. We, we won't go into it because we're talking about other things, but just the intersection of rectangles, uh, both vertical and horizontal, how the tree branch points across to the central uh, man and uh, the repetition of figures on the left and figures on the right and so forth. But uh, a wonderful, but it's ordered, it's mathematically controlled. Seurat is the great classicist, but I would submit that their Seurat is more of a romantic than we ever knew, at least I ever knew. Well, I've never encountered people talking about this quality in his work, but uh, uh, and I've just sort of passed over his work in, in saying, oh yeah, order of math, uh, mathematical quality, classicism, uh, and, and sort of let this po poetic melancholy aspect of his work slip through my fingers, which was revealed by the show of drawings at the Met. Uh, and really, it's quite apparent here in this next painting, uh, an early one uh, painted in the early 1880s <coughs> and evidently reworked later, but doesn't that woodland scene, it's not really pointillism, it, it's, it's, a, it's impressionism more than pointillism, and we know it's Seurat, so we sense a certain order there in the tree trunks and a certain ordering in the brush strokes, but there's the roughened paint surface. Uh, it gleams with light and it, it echoes with, with poetry and uh, a sense of perhaps the, nat the melancholy of nature, the melancholy of life, because let's face it, we're not here forever. And uh, ever, all things must die, all things change, nothing lasts, whether youth, love, beauty, or belief, everything is, is swept away in the onrush of time. And uh, the poetry in that picture, and we'll, we'll go to the next one, the poetry in that woodland scene uh, is reminiscent of some things by Albert Pinkham Ryder, perhaps Ralph Blakelock, and some other uh, mystical uh, nature painters. We, we look at a painting at the end of his life uh, off the Normandy coast. Seurat dies tragically young, about the age of 32 in 1891. A, a tragic 
uh, ending, you know, and everyone speculates where would he have gone, and of course no one knows. No, no, one, no one can say what would have happened uh, to this man if he had lived another 30 or 40 years. But look at the spare quality of this late painting. Uh, I submit, while I'm not, as you're well aware, I'm not one of the biggest fans of abstraction, uh, I, I feel that it, it eliminates too much, it narrows uh, our human focus, it makes us forget ourselves as human beings and our, our role in the world, that there's an awful lot of Mondrian in this picture, the sense of a certain spare majesty, which I will grant Mondrian is having. I, I think he is a, a powerful, significant painter, but a limited painter, and uh, perhaps we can close on that picture. I, I think maybe that's, that, that's the appropriate uh, painting to look at as, as we uh, share our final thoughts here, that there's a certain uh, poetry, you know, a certain sense of the uh, majesty of life uh, connected with the, some of the, the sorrow over its transience, the fact that we don't really know why we're here or what it was all about, but we did our best while we were here. There's a spare, abstract quality to it that, that gives us painting strength and aligns it with uh, uh, some of the great final statements of, uh, of uh, other greater paintings, perhaps, in Sorrell. Sorrell is great, but maybe there are others greater. Take care. We'll see you later.